want to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, specifically for healthcare providers who are authorized to treat workers' compensation patients. And today we will be sharing the latest updates on several initiatives that are helping to make the board better for healthcare providers and the workers' compensation system overall. I'm Adam Rossi from the Communication and Outreach Unit here at the Workers' Compensation Board. Joining me today, we have Paula Rauch, Audrey Cunningham, Christopher Failing, and Eileen Moss from our Medical Director's Office, as well as Dan Giovanangelo from our Office of Regulatory Affairs. They will be on hand to answer your questions today. We do want to remind you, please keep your phone lines muted. We will be answering questions via the chat feature today. You can enter your questions throughout the presentation in the chat box. The icon should be located on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to uh, enter your questions at any time throughout the presentation. However, we will be waiting until the end of the presentation to answer your questions. We will answer as many of your questions as we can, but if you have questions that we either don't get to today, or if you think of something after the session ends, we will be providing you with resources at the end of today's presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, the board has been working towards making the workers' compensation system better for injured workers, better for businesses, and better for healthcare providers through several modernization efforts that improve stakeholder interactions within our systems. We've undertaken several initiatives to improve healthcare and enhance the experience of treating providers. We are making it easier than ever for board authorized providers to be a part of the workers' compensation system. We are truly working to take the comp out of complicated. And as we move forward, we want to share our progress with you. Our agenda today includes a brief overview of the board's medical portal, which you will need access uh, for to some of the board's more innovative tools. We will then review on board the board's business information system. Next, we'll look at the New York Medical Treatment Guidelines, also known as the MTGs. We also want to go over some things you should know regarding the board's use of the CMS 1500 form, which went into effect on July 1st of 2022. Finally, we would like to remind you about some things you should be aware of regarding workers' compensation and COVID-19, and then review the additional resources available to help you. We will leave time at the end of the presentation for your questions, as I mentioned. Let's start with the medical portal, which is the gateway to all applications you need. The medical portal offers convenient access to trainings, the MTG lookup tool, drug formulary lookup tool, and onboard all in one place. The portal also has a link to the XML agreement, which providers need to accept prior to sending CMS 1500 forms electronically through a clearinghouse. In order to access the medical portal, you will need to request a board assigned ny.gov user ID and password. This is not the personal ny.gov ID that you may have with other agencies, such as the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Department of Taxation and Finance. The ny.gov user ID and temporary password will be generated for you when you submit a request for medical portal access. You can request access on the board's website at wcb.ny.gov. Just go to the providers page and select medical portal, which is under the quick links section. When requesting access for the portal, you are required to provide the following information. Your healthcare provider NPI. If you're a nurse practitioner, you must request access using your RN license. You also need your email address. This should be your individual work email address, not a group or practice email address. The following types of healthcare providers may request access. Acupuncturists, chiropractors, licensed clinical social workers, physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, podiatrists, psychologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, dentists, audiologists, optometrists, and DME suppliers and labs. If you are a healthcare provider and your specialty is not one of these listed, 
and you need access to onboard to submit a request for decision on unpaid medical bills, which is form HP 1.0, you will need to request access as a medical supplier. Please note, while all of the above reference provider types and entities may access the medical portal, they do not all have the same privileges within the onboard system, which we will discuss later. This chart here on your screen shows what certain providers can do once given access to the medical portal. You can view this chart on the healthcare provider overview page at wcb.ny.gov slash medical portal. It is important to keep your information up to date with the board. The board does not distinguish between never authorized providers and those who lapse in authorization. Healthcare providers must renew every two or three years. At the same time, you renew your registration with the New York State Education Department, but as a separate and distinct process. And sometimes things change during that time period, such as your address, your phone number, your email, etc. So to update your information, please log into the medical portal. Under the medical provider section, select either new provider authorization request, authorization renewal, or update authorization information. As we mentioned earlier, the board is working towards making it easier than ever for board authorized providers to be part of the workers' compensation system. That's why we are very pleased that the first phase of our business information system on board, one of the largest modernization efforts at the board to date has been fully live as of May 2nd of 2022. Use of the new system was rolled out in three phases, beginning with the submission of prior authorization requests, also known as PARs, for medication, which are known in the system as medication PARs. Today, providers and payers are using Onboard to request and review prior authorization for medication, durable medical equipment, or DME, and treatment and testing, and we have hundreds of PARs successfully throwing through our system every day. To date, more than 49,000 healthcare providers have registered for Onboard, and more than 33,000 delegates have been added. And since Onboard launched on March 7th of 2022, more than 766,000 PARs have been filed. Approximately 95% of these are resolved within one to 30 days at the level one or level two stages of review. If you haven't already done so, we strongly encourage you to sign up for Onboard as soon as possible. Healthcare providers must use the medical portal to access Onboard or to renew an authorization, which again requires an ny.gov user ID and password for access. The updated medical portal section of the board's website contains full details and information you need regarding how to register and get an ny.gov user ID and password to access Onboard, and also to grant access to others to act as your delegate. Visit the provider section at wcb.ny.gov slash Onboard for a guide on registration if you need it. Here are a few examples of how Onboard makes the workers' compensation system easier. For one, it provides increased accuracy, paperless transactions, and a user-friendly interface for interacting with payers in the board. Healthcare providers can now request board action on unpaid medical bills through submission of Form HP 1.0 to ensure accuracy and a timely receipt. Electronic submission of PARs for treatment, medication, and DME PARs for complicated and or invasive medical procedures, such as special services, may also be submitted. It eliminates the confusion on which forms to use. And all submissions are automatically routed to the correct party with a time and date stamp, so there will be no more wrong fax number scenarios. We do want to note the new DM DME fee schedule did become effective with the launch of Onboard. Assigning delegates, such as your office support staff, can also assist you. They can draft PARs, which must be reviewed and submitted by the healthcare provider. They can monitor provider OBLR dashboards for payer responses to PARs. 
It can also help by drafting escalations to level two medication PARs, which must be reviewed and submitted by the healthcare provider. You can also draft and submit PAR escalations to level three for a medical director's office review. It can respond to ensure requests for information, and they can help with drafting and submitting form HP 1.0. Please note, however, the board strongly advises against a pharmacy, pharmacy employee, a DME vendor, or medical supplier serving as a delegate of the provider or prescriber to prepare PARs. We believe that for most workers' compensation prescriptions, the prescription writing is outside the scope of practice of a pharmacy or medical supplier or vendor. Moreover, even if it were within the said scope of practice, we fail to see how the pharmacist or the supplier or vendor would have enough direct knowledge and understanding of the patient's clinical history and status or direct access to the provider prescriber to appropriately recommend and or provide medical justification for the PAR. Finally, we believe that such a relationship runs a very real risk of the pharmacy or the supplier or vendor and the provider prescriber running afoul of state and federal anti-kickback laws. You can visit the link on this slide uh, to view a registration guide for healthcare providers. We would also like to note that delegates cannot do the following in onboard. They cannot accept the XML submission partner agreement. They cannot register with the medical portal and they cannot report on a provider status. This chart here labels what submissions certain provider types can make in onboard. For example, as you will see, all the provider types listed can submit form HP 1.0, non-MTGs under or equal to $1,000 PARs, and non-MTG over $1,000 PARs. But not all provider types can submit medication PARs. You can view this chart if you have any questions on the provider overview page again at WCB dot ny dot gov slash onboard. Once your PAR is submitted, the insurer has a set number of days to respond. Response requirements vary for certain PAR types. Responses for MTG confirmation are always required within eight business days. MTG variants and MTG special services responses are required within 15 calendar days, but the response time is extended to 30 days if an IME is requested. Non-MTG over $1,000 responses are required within 30 calendar days. Non-MTG under or equal to $1,000 responses are required within eight business days. And medication and durable medical equipment responses are due within four calendar days. Of note for medication PARs requiring level three review by the medical director's office, the overwhelming majority are resolved within one to two business days and almost all are resolved within three business days. We also wanna note that there is some variation on response times in, gar in regards to weekends and holidays. And you can visit the board's website at wcb.ny.gov slash onboard slash providers. And you can see the PAR review section on the overview tab. We are often asked how providers can expedite the PAR process. Here are a few helpful tips to receive timely responses to your PARs. One, submit the correct PAR type. Two, submit supporting documentation, which includes any relevant diagnostic imaging and or testing reports with the original PAR submission and do not merely refer to the medical record. Three, use the MTG lookup tool, which is located in the medical portal, or you can search, uh, cut and paste your MTG reference for the requested clinical intervention and include a copy of your result with the PAR. Number four, check, or you can have your dele delegate check, the onboard limited release dashboard regularly for insurer responses and request level two and level three reviews in a timely manner. Also respond timely with additional information when a carrier initiates a request for further information, also known as an RFI in the system. Number five, include a clear clinical rationale for the request in the medical narrative section 
clearly stating why a variance from the MTGs might be necessary. Number six, when escalating a PAR to a level three MDO review, include a rebuttal that addresses the insurer's level two denial rationale in the escalation reason field, rather than simply copying and pasting previously provided clinical. Number seven, use the appropriate MTG reference codes and only use none when the MTGs do not address the specific treatment being requested. Lastly, number eight, include the frequency and duration, if applicable, for the proposed treatment in the medical necessity field. And if the request is for post-operative therapy, include the date of the surgery. In May 2022, the board updated existing New York medical treatment guidelines, which are also known as MTGs, and new MTGs were also added. For any newly authorized providers with us today, here's some quick background on the MTGs. In December of 2010, the board implemented legislatively mandated MTGs that fundamentally changed the delivery of healthcare to the injured workers. The MTGs initially included four evidence-based guidelines for the treatment of injuries involving the neck, back, shoulder, and knee. These became the mandatory standard of care for dates of service on or after December 1st of 2010. On March 1st, 2013, the carpal tunnel syndrome MTG and updated versions of the then non-existing, uh, I'm sorry, of the then existing MTGs, including a new maintenance care program were adopted. The non-acute pain MTG, as well as the updated version of the existing MTGs were implemented for dates of treatment on or after December 15th of 2014. The MTGs effective for treatment as of May 2nd, 2022 are listed here on your slide. Please visit the medical treatment guidelines section on the provider page of the board's website for more details. You can access full details on these new and updated MTGs, including a fully searchable and cut and pasteable PDF of the respective MTGs on the board's website at wcb.ny.gov. Select providers on the top of the homepage, scroll down to resources, and select medical treatment guidelines under the treatment section. You will also find links to MTG trainings currently available for medical and non-medical professionals. As of December 29th of 2022, these programs are temporarily unavailable for CME credit, but they are expected to resume soon. The board will announce when the courses for CME credit become available again, so please watch for an update on that. The non-credit bearing courses, however, are still available. To access the trainings, just visit the board's website, again, wcb.ny.gov, and navigate to the healthcare provider section in the middle of the homepage. Select the medical treatment guidelines link. From there, select the training link on the right side of the page. And just a reminder about the availability of the MTG lookup tool in the medical portal. The MTG lookup tool allows users to quickly determine whether a part, particular condition or treatment test combination is recommended, not recommended, or conditional according to the MTGs. Note this does not constitute a prior authorization, but can be submitted as part of the PAR process. When a treatment or test name is selected, the relevant section of the full MTGs for that condition will display. This online tool will help speed treatment decisions and ultimately provide more effective and efficient care for injured workers. The MTG lookup tool also has a feature for use by providers that produces a verification summary document in a PDF form that confirms the lookup was completed, provides treatment recommendations for that condition, and displays patient-specific case information. This document can be kept by the healthcare provider or attached to any request for service or medical bill being sent to an insurer as verification that the treatment adheres to the recommendations set forth in the MTGs. The MTG lookup tool is available for all MTGs. To access the medical portal and lookup tool, just visit the board's website, select the medical portal from the online services menu at the top of the homepage. Another exciting initiative to help streamline processes and reduce paperwork in the workers' compensation system 
is the board's adoption of the CMS 1500 form. To reduce the administrative burden on board authorized healthcare providers, the board made the strategic decision to consolidate and eliminate certain medical billing forms in transition to using the CMS 1500 form, the universal claim form used by medical providers to bill the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, known as CMS, as well as health insurers. As of July 1st of 2022, providers must submit the CMS 1500 form. Electronic submission through an XML submission partner is strongly encouraged, although currently not required. As part of the initiative, use of prior medical billing reports, including the doctor's initial report, Form C4, and the doctor's progress report, Form C4.2, have been discontinued. A full listing of discontinued forms will be discussed later in this presentation. Providers must prominently report the injured worker's temporary impairment percentage, work status, and the causal relationship of the injury at the top of the CMS 1500 form medical narrative. We do want to note provider types who are not permitted to opine on causal relationship or level of impairment are not required to submit this information. Payers are required to use the new Notice of Treatment Issue or Disputed Bill form C8.1B and notice to healthcare provider and injured worker of a carrier's refusal to pay all or a portion of a medical bill due to valuation objections form C8.4 with applicable claim adjustment reason codes which are known as CARCs to object to medical bills. Workers' compensation payers will electronically transmit any explanation of benefits to their XML submission partners upon adjudication of the associated electronic CMS 1500 medical bills. Payers are also required to use specific CARCs on the provider EOBs and EORs when objecting to payment of a medical bill, whether the bills are received through an XML submission partner or on paper. We do want to note when filling out the CMS 1500 form, please be aware that fields four and seven are intended to capture the employer's name and address. Uh, the board has been receiving some forms listings the uh, patient's name and address in those files. So we just wanted to make you aware of that real quick. Again, if you are not already using the medical portal, you are encouraged to sign up now so you may take advantage of all the online services the board offers, including electronic submission of medical bills to payers in the, uh, in the board. Once you have accepted the terms of XML submission, you can then discuss details of submission with an approved XML submission partner, which is also known as a clearinghouse. After logging into the medical portal, Providers who have not already signed up for an XML submission of the CMS 1500 will see a link for Agreement for XML Submission of CMS 1500. You can see that right there on your screen, right under the billing section. Select the link and then select the I Accept button. The provider's name will be added to the listing of providers authorized to submit XML data, which is updated daily. Once accepted, the link will no longer appear when you sign in again. We have received several questions about submitting the CMS 1500 form electronically. Here are a couple things you need to know as we make the transition from paper to electronic submission. Electronic submission of medical bills by healthcare providers through an XML submission partner, again, is strongly encouraged, although it is currently not required. To date, more than 17,000 providers have registered with the board to submit bills electronically through an XML submission partner. More than 9,000 providers have successfully submitted electronically through an XML, XML submission partner. And when providers submit CMS 1500 forms electronically through an XML submission partner, the XML submission partner will submit the forms to both the carrier and the board. We'd also like to take a minute to highlight the many benefits of electronic submission. For one, providers will have confirmation within seven days that their bill was accepted or rejected by the payer. Providers also typically get paid quicker. With acknowledgement of receipt from the payer, the provider is aware that they should not resubmit the bill. 
Also, technical errors are identified quickly, so they may be corrected and resubmitted instead of waiting for the payer to deny the bill. For more information on this, you can visit the CMS 1500 section of our website at wcb.ny.gov slash CMS 1500, or you can email CMS 1500 at wcb.ny.gov. When the medical narrative template is used, providers must attach a narrative report with clinic vis visit history examination findings, including the history of the injury or illness, any objective findings based on the clinical evaluation, the diagnosis of the, and assessment of the patient, and the plan of care. Just noting here that this is really no different than the minimum standard of care requirements for documentation of any clinical encounter, whether it be workers' comp or non-workers' comp. The board has developed a medical narrative report template that can be used to create the medical narrative report that accompanies most provider submissions of the CMS 1500 form. The template includes the three elements to include with narratives. Again, the patient's work status, causal relationship of the injury or illness to the patient's work activities, and temporary impairment percentage. It is imperative for providers who are expected to do so to include these three elements to ensure workers receive the treatment and indemnity benefits they are entitled to, and for prompt payment to the provider, especially, for example, if an injured worker is with a long-term condition is not working, is at MMI, and has an unchanged level of impairment, and the provider simply documents clinical, occupational, and functional status unchanged from last visit. It is also important to note that certain provider types are not permitted and therefore not required to provide impairment percentages or opinions on causal relationship. A medical narrative report may be found legally defective if these elements are missing. However, payers should not use this as the sole basis for non-payment. A PDF of the report can be found at wcb.ny.gov slash CMS 1500 slash requirements under the medical narrative requirements section. For certain types of medical services or supplies, a medical narrative is not applicable. Instead, an attachment is required. For example, a radiologist should submit the radiological report with the CMS 1500, and a DME supplier should submit the physician order with their bill. A full list of attachment examples may also be found in the requirements section of the website. As a reminder, I mentioned earlier, we have a, a list of forms that have now been discontinued with the CMS 1500. You can see that list here on your screen. It is important to note that form C.4.3 C is not being replaced by the CMS 1500 form. Pursuant to section 12 NYCRR, 325-1.25B1. Bills submitted in any other format after July 1st of 2022, including bills submitted on the C4 family of forms with the exception of form C4.3, shall not be eligible for an award issued through the medical dispute process under the provisions of the workers' compensation law. Although Form C4.3 is not being replaced with the CMS 1500 form, the CMS 1500 can still be used by medical providers who are submitting electronically. However, there are specific guidelines which must be followed when submitting medical bills for permanency evaluations. It is very important that medical providers use either CPT code 99243 or 99245 for permanency evaluations. Code 99245 is used for examinations and reports of non-scheduled permanency evaluations, and 99243 is used for examinations and report of scheduled permanency evaluations. When using either of these CPT codes, they should be the only code billed on the CMS 1500. 
a completed form C4.3 should be attached to the CMS 1500 form as the medical narrative attachment. Finally, when billing electronically for permanency evaluations, it is not necessary to separately send the form C4.3 via mail, email, or web upload to the board. Finally, we want to make you aware of the resources we have been sharing with injured workers who believe they may have contracted COVID-19 in the workplace. The board strongly encourages workers to file a claim if they believe they contracted COVID-19 at work. However, the insurance carrier must notify the board of the incident. Workers have two years from the onset of illness to file a claim. This is especially important right now because some workers who were diagnosed with COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic have that deadline approaching or they've surpassed it. A positive PCR test is needed for a worker to file a claim. The board has been holding free informational webinars to the public on this topic. You can visit wcb.ny.gov slash webinars for a list of upcoming presentations to learn more. I can tell you the next one we have will be in May, and you will hear me on that presentation as well, so I hope you have time to join us for that. As we continue to work on implementing improvements for healthcare providers, we are committed to increased communication with providers, such as this webinar and targeted emails. The board has also created a special web page dedicated to sharing timely updates on various board initiatives with healthcare provider focus. Please visit the board's website at wcb.ny.gov and select the provider updates quick link on the provider page. You can see it right there on your screen. We are also committed to regular engagement regarding onboard. As primary users of the new system, your input and engagement in the project is very important. For more information on onboard, please visit wcb.ny.gov slash onboard. Resources include a walkthrough of the registration process, video tutorials, and recorded presentations for providers. For more information on the CMS 1500 form, please visit wcb.ny.gov slash CMS 1500. We also have a dedicated mailbox to answer all questions on the CMS 1500 initiative, and that email address you'll see on your screen is cms1500 at wcb.ny.gov. If you have provider-specific questions, you can call our helpline at 800-781-2362, or you can email our medical director's office at mdo at wcb.ny.gov. You can also find the latest provider updates on the, on the board's website. Visit wcb.ny.gov and select the provider updates quick link on the provider page. I also want to mention real quick, I see a question in, the, in uh, the chat asking if these slides are available. If you go to the provider page on our website, uh, you should be able to find a link to not only the slides for this presentation, but as well as a recorded version. And those are updated every time we have a, a webinar such as this one today. You can also stay informed by subscribing to get board notifications straight to your inbox at wcb.ny.gov. Select the Get Notifications on the bottom of the homepage. You get to choose the topics you'd like to subscribe to. You can also follow the board on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for board news, project updates, trainings, and more. And I had mentioned uh, just previously that we have a recorded version of this webinar on our website that can also be found on our YouTube page, along with dozens of other recorded webinars. So I strongly encourage you to check that out as well. Again, just go to youtube.com and search for the New York State Workers' Compensation Board. Thank you for attending this presentation. We will now take the rest of the time to answer any questions you may have. Again, we are taking your questions via the chat box. I do see some questions have already come in. If you have a question, feel free to type it in and our subject matter experts will take a look at it. There's gonna be a brief period of silence as I'm now going to turn it over to them to uh, check the questions that have come in and answer them. Uh, let me just go back real quick to this contact information screen. So again, thank you again, and I'm now going to hand it over to our experts to answer your questions. So this is Audrey Cunningham from the board's medical director's office. Uh, the first question refers to the DME fee schedule. Uh, the board is no longer using the Medicaid DME fee schedule. Um, 
The board's DME, the new DME fee schedule has been in effect since April 4th, 2022. Um, it is on the board's website, and I'm just sending the link uh, in the chat box right now. Hi everyone, this is Paula Rausch from the Medical Director's Office. There's a, another question related to PAR requests. Um, one of the attendees has said that they found a procedure code that is not listed when requesting authorization. Is there a way to enter description of service? The procedure code is 64454. Um, so just so everyone is aware, the only codes um, that are found in OBLR, the only codes that you're allowed to request for are codes that are in our current medical fee schedule. That particular code is not there. If a code that is not, if there's a code that is not listed, the provider could submit a PAR using an unlisted procedure code, but you would need to identify in the medical necessity free text field um, what the exact procedure is and a exact description. Hi, this is Dan Giovanangelo. Um, we have a question, is the Clearinghouse EBI an approved XML submission partner? Um, we're, we're not familiar with that particular Clearinghouse. We do have eight um, that are currently um, with the board and they're also on our CMS 1500 uh, website. Many of those different uh, XML sub submission partners that are registered with the board do uh, uh, work with a lot of other clearinghouses to get your bills to the correct payer. Um, if you're currently with one of those clearinghouses, um, I would suggest you know um, making sure with with your clearinghouse that they work with one of the the board's XML submission partners. Uh, there's a question asking to go over how to apply for DME or an MRI having issues with this process. Um, I'm, I'm assuming this is the PAR process. Um, if it is, we can certainly have one of our nurses reach out to you if you want to send an email to the MDO at wcd.ny.gov, and I will put that in the chat for everyone to see. Um, if you want to send us an example, and I can certainly have one of the nurses reach out to you and provide assistance with the PAR process. Hi, this is Dan again. Um, we have a question. Will all payers be required to accept electronic submissions via XML submission partners in the future? Currently, some are still only accepting paper. Um, all payers are, are currently required to accept bills electronically. If you do come across a, a payer that is not accepting electronically, please email uh, our CMS 1500 mailbox to let us know, and we can look into it for you guys. Hi, uh, there's a question from an acupuncturist that has a pain management nurse practitioner interested in referring. Um, the best resource to educate staff on getting prior authorizations can be found on our main website. We have specific training related to um, each group, um, providers, attorneys, etc. Uh, and on there, there are some really wonderful training um, slides that, that give actual screenshots so you can kind of follow along as you're doing it. We also can provide you with some assistance once you've gone through that. If there's additional questions and you want to email the medical director's office, please feel free to do that. We can have one of the nurses reach out. Thank you. Hi, there's a question with respect to uh, physical therapists uh, and whether or not they're able to get a status on a PAR that a different provider submitted. Um, all, uh, only the provider who actually submits the prior authorization is able to, to get a status for that prior authorization. Uh, so that, that goes along all provider types. The provider submitting the authorization is the one that can see the status for the prior authorization. Uh, this kind of dovetails with that with that question. Can physical therapists upload reports on on, on board? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, only the only people with the ability to upload a report to on board would be at the time that the PAR is created. The system allows um, 
whoever is creating the PAR to upload supporting documentation. Uh, Onboard is not a collective entity of like a whole saving case files and, and multiple documents. If there's something specific that you want sent to the case file, that would be different than uploading it to Onboard. All right, that seems to be all the questions we are able to answer today. Again, if you had a question that we didn't get to, feel free to shoot it over to the MDO mailbox, mdo at wcb.ny.gov. If you have a question regarding CMS 1500 or XML submission, you can see that email address right there on your screen at cms1500 at wcb.ny.gov. Again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our team for being on hand to answer your questions. When we close out of this webinar, I do wanna let you know you will be directed to take a brief survey on today's presentation. We greatly appreciate you taking a few minutes to let us know how we're doing with these presentations so we know how to improve them. And um, I would again like to also remind you to sign up for workers' compensation news, including information on future webinars straight to your inbox. Just go to our website at wcb.ny.gov, scroll down to the bottom of the home page and select get WCB notifications. Again, we also distribute information via social media. So make sure you're following the board on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And again, that YouTube page is very, very helpful for anyone who's looking for previously recorded versions of this webinar. We have dozens upon dozens of videos for providers um, and for the workers' compensation system in general. So any questions you need to know, you can probably find a recorded webinar that we've answered that question on. Also, don't forget to visit the provider-specific page on our website. Uh, you can go, we regularly update on what's new and important for providers and what you need to be aware of. Just visit wcb.ny.gov and select the provider updates quick link on the provider page. Again, thank you all for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.